Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. We have a show question and answer for you now. We are going to go through questions that we have received by telephone, by email, by message, by text, you name it. Lots of them here. I have not previewed them, so I'm going to answer them for you right off the cuff. I'm not looking to do any specific research. I'll give you my best answer that I can. If it turns out that you're getting information that you find is in conflict with what your understanding is, please reach out to me and we'll do a little bit of a deeper dive. Remember, we're always looking to get your questions, so please call at 559-656-0317. You can also text anytime at 567-4CARL. That's 567-367-5275. With that, let's just jump right in with the first set of questions. I do have them categorized by types of insurance. First question says, why did my auto insurance premium increase after having a non-moving violation? Now, let's try and define this a little bit, a non-moving violation. I assume they're talking about either somebody hit their car while it was parked, or maybe something fell on the car and damaged it. Now, depending on the state that you're in, some states have laws and their regulations state that in the event that you do have physical damage to your vehicle while your damage is not in motion and it's not your fault, that's what could be could be considered a comprehensive claim. Comprehensive claims in many states are not chargeable. So, for example, if something falls on your car in the garage and damages it, The car is not in motion, there's no fault to be assigned. That should typically not be something that you would be surcharged for. Again, your policy may vary and the state regulations could vary as well. So in general, if someone were to say they're having a non-moving, non-fault accident, that's typically not something that I would see as being a trigger for a premium increase. This email said a premium increase based on just a non-moving violation. It is possible that if you have a non-moving violation that you can have a premium increase. It just depends on what that violation is. So hopefully that answers your question. The next question says, can I use my personal insurance for Uber or Lyft driving? Very timely question. We hear about ride sharing all the time and Uber and Lyft seem to be the dominant forces. Most insurance policies, if they are what we call them unendorsed, meaning they're not changed from their standard form, are not going to provide coverage for you while you're doing ride sharing, while you're basically driving for hire. Having said that, most companies now have the option to add coverage in for that, meaning you can pay, and it's not expensive actually, it's a nominal amount of money to change your policy so that it would extend while you're doing that type of, uh, while you're doing that type of driving. Understand this always gets interesting when it talk when you talk about driving for hire. At what point does it become driving for hire? We've got one point when you're just driving around waiting to see if the app is going to ding and say you have someone. That's one set of driving. Then there's driving once you've received that notification and you accept it, but you have not yet picked up a rider. There's that set of driving. Then there's the set of driving after you've accepted it to get to your pickup point. There's that set of driving. Then there's the set of driving as you're driving with the person that you've picked up. And then finally, there's driving until that person gets out of the car and you mark that as a complete ride. So there's a lot of different segments that fall into place when you're talking about being an Uber or Lyft driver. So you wanna be sure that you're covering yourself for all of those different possible times, because believe me, the insurance carriers and the policies are very specific about when they're going to cover you and when they won't. Remember, personal auto insurance, this is not what it was designed for. It was designed for you and I to have a car and to drive it, not to be driving our car as a business, which is in essence what you're doing at that point. So the short answer is now that you understand that there are so many different variations in rideshare, different time periods where coverage may or may not apply, it's important to check with your insurance agent or broker or with the insurance company and find out if you have coverage for that and if you don't, what you can do to add that in. Don't just assume, don't bury your head in the sand and just say, well, I'm sure it's fine. 
Chances are it is not, because again, you're talking about a very specific type of coverage that is not typically on the average auto policy. Next question says, how do I handle an insurance claim for a hit and run accident? Haven't seen one of these in a long time. Hit and runs are scary. They're scary and they're dangerous because you don't know who they are or who you're dealing with. I never tell people chase after the person, try and get their license. But you, you know what? If somebody is going to hit your car and take off, chances are this is not somebody that you want to screw around with, right? So how do you deal with it? The first thing I would suggest is, like I said, don't chase after the person. If you're able to snap a picture and get their license plate, that's good because as you may not may know or may not know, uh, hit and run is a felony. So that's a big deal. That's a big lawbreaker. So in the event that you want to, in, and you can safely capture the driving, the license plate of the vehicle, that could be helpful. Now, as far as your insurance policy goes, this is where it gets interesting. Let's just say you're not able to capture the license plate of the vehicle that hits you. You go to your insurance carrier and you say, hey, I was victim of a hit and run. The carrier says, well, how do we know? Now, before you get all frustrated, think about this for a moment. If the insurance carrier would just take everyone at their word that it was hit and run, then when would we ever see a claim happen where somebody would say, I was in an accident, they hit me, I hit them, whatever it is, because then we have to deal with a third party, we have to deal with fault, we have to deal with all these other things. People would just say all the time, whenever there's damage to their car, yeah, it was a hit and run, hit and run, and then not have to worry about it. So unfortunately, because we have to be in a position of the carriers knowing if it was an actual hit and run or not, if they are not able to verify that another vehicle hits you and took off, that's why I said if you can get that license plate number, it's a good thing to get, then chances are you're going to have to deal with your insurance carrier. There might be deductibles, there might be things that you have to take care of that you might not want to. And, and I get it, I have dealt with this with clients before, and it is definitely frustrating because you're hit and run. You're angry, something's wrong. This was, I mean, talk about a violation, right? And now you have to pay a deductible. So it's important to understand the reason, the rationale is we have to, as an industry, hold people accountable and be able to show proof that yes, there was some other person that hit you and left. Otherwise, the system doesn't work. The system breaks down because everybody's running around just saying, yep, hit and run, pay my bill, no deductible, hit and run, pay my bill, no deductible, and, and they move on from there. Frustrating, but that's the reality that we live in. I wanna take our first quick break. When we come back, we will continue with questions that we have received from you. I really appreciate you taking the time to send them in. Remember, you can call 559-656-0317 or email your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. Once again, this is Insurance Hour. I'm your host, Carl Sussman, and we will be back in a flash. Let's talk about earthquakes for a minute. Look, we know we live in earthquake country here in California. Powerful, devastating earthquakes have happened here before, and science says that they will happen again. They can't tell us exactly when, they can just tell us that it is going to happen. Count on it, prepare for it. Did you know that earthquakes are not covered by your homeowner's insurance policy? You need a separate policy to give you the peace of mind that you will be able to recover without getting financially wiped out the next time we get hit with a big one. There is a great company here in California that will provide you with earthquake coverage you need at a price you can afford. That company is GeoVera. I have a policy through GeoVera. I really like how easy it is to choose from all of their great coverage options, backed by the financial strength that lets me know that they will be here for me when I need them the most. Go to getquake.com forward slash insurance hour to learn more. That's getquake.com slash insurance hour. Make sure you're ready for the day when the ground shakes again. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Remember, the phone lines are open, 559-656-0317. You can send your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. Also, if you want to get texting right away, get some information, you can send us a text to 567-4-CARL. That's 567-367-5275. We are taking your questions today and emails and text messages and voicemails, questions that we have received from everybody. So let's jump right back in. The next question I have up is, why was my car insurance claim denied despite having full coverage? Wow, this could be an entire show all by itself. Now, claims are denied based on the validity of the claim and how they are applying to the policy that you have. 
Full coverage is my least favorite expression because what does full coverage mean? What full coverage might mean to me is different than it means to you. For example, I might think full coverage is a million dollars in liability, $50 deductibles for comp and collision, maximum rental car, coordinated medical payments, um, lease loan gap coverage, collision deductible waiver. I could go on and on and on, right? Full coverage to you might mean uh, minimum state limits and uh, comprehensive and collision with a $500 or $1,000 deductible. There is no specific terminology that defines what is full coverage. So when we hear full coverage, I always kind of, you know, eek, what does that mean? What are they referring to? What are they expecting to have? This brings me back to a general concept that I'll share with you. It's important that you know what you have. I know nobody loves this stuff. Insurance is not exciting and sexy and it's not something that everyone loves to spend a lot of time with. I totally get it. Believe me, I do. I do this for a living. I enjoy it, but I can completely understand why if you're not doing this for a living and you're not really involved in this, you're not really in the weeds, this is not something you're going to enjoy doing. But having said that, you do have a responsibility to understand what it is that you have. And whenever I hear full coverage, and this could be for an auto policy, a home policy, anything, I always stop because there is no such thing as full coverage. What is full coverage? You need to talk to your agent, broker, or carrier. You need to find out what coverage you do have, what coverage you want to have, and be sure that there's a, a meeting of the minds, if you will, and you understand the coverage that you have and you don't have any surprises if you ever have a claim, all right? Next question, how can I lower my auto insurance premium after multiple tickets? Ooh, that's a good question. First of all, stop getting those tickets. What are you doing? Drive safer, sorry, I just had to get that out. That was the insurance agent, that was the father, that was everything just coming out. So if you have multiple tickets, the first thing I'll say is whenever you get a ticket, and, and this is state specific, but most states, they will allow you to go to traffic school depending on certain circumstances. And one of those things has to do with how many tickets you have and when was the last ticket you had. Some states will allow you to go to traffic school, which mind you is just doing something online now. It's not even as if you have to go and sit somewhere and sit through something. You're going to sit online through a course and go through a process. By going to traffic school, that ticket magically disappears. And if that ticket magically disappears, it's not going to impact your driving record and it's not going to impact your insurance premium, okay? Again, state specific, most states will let you go to traffic school for a moving violation or a ticket every 18 months to 24 months. It depends on the state that you're in. So the first thing I say when someone says, I, was, I just got a ticket as I say, full stop, go to traffic school, just go because you wanna be sure that you can keep that ticket off of your driving record. Now, people might say, oh, not a big deal, it's only a $100 ticket, blah, blah, blah. What they don't understand is it might be a $100 ticket, but it means that their insurance premium is going to go up because their insurance carrier is going to, rightfully so, I might add, look at them as a different risk. Before, you had no tickets, and now you have tickets. Which person do you think is more likely to be involved in an accident? The person with the tickets. So it's not so much the cost of the ticket. It's more of the cost, the long-term cost, the cost for several years potentially or more of what you're paying in insurance premium because you have that ticket on your record now. You follow me? So what can you do to lower your rate after multiple tickets? Sounds like at least the most recent ticket, hopefully, you still have the ability to go to traffic school for. You're still going to pay for the ticket, by the way. That doesn't get you out of that but it will stop the ticket most likely from showing on your driving record, in which case it's not going to impact your premium that you're paying for your auto insurance. If you've passed all of those times, right? You haven't gone to traffic school, it's too late, you've paid the ticket, or you've gone to traffic school too soon related to when your last ticket was and your last traffic school was, then the best thing you can do to try and lower your premium after having all of those tickets, number one is stop having tickets. And number two, talk to your agent or broker, find out what types of deductibles you might be able to raise to lower your premium, something to try and potentially offset what you are probably paying, which is an increase from what you were paying prior to having the tickets, all right? Not fun, I get it. But again, the carrier has to look at you today. They can't look at you and say, well, for 20 years, you never had a ticket. And now you have a ticket, ah! We'll just forget about that because the problem is for 20 years without a ticket, you were paying a rate as someone that was without tickets every single year. But now you have a ticket. So now you're a guy or a gal 
driving with a ticket. So you have to accept the fact that you are a different risk than you were before you had the ticket. I know it sucks, I'm, I'm totally with you, but that's the reality. Next question, is it necessary to get commercial auto insurance when renting out cars on Turo? Oh, look at that. We actually spoke with an assembly person specifically about Turo in an earlier show. Uh, if you check on YouTube or on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're watching or listening to this, you'll be able to find that. We had a really interesting talk about that. Uh, Turo is an interesting situation, and I would suggest that you always check with your insurance agent or broker to find out what coverage you have what coverage might be applicable when using Turo and find out if there's additional coverage that you're eligible or that you can purchase. My two cents is if you're having strangers potentially drive your car, I would wanna have a lot of insurance because you have no idea who's taking your car. And remember, you are the registered owner of that vehicle, meaning that your insurance company is going to pay before any other. It's going to pay before the driver of the car in an accident, it's going to pay before Turo's insurance policy would pay. The registered owner's policy always pays first. So you wanna be sure that you pay close attention to the limits that you have if you're going to be using a service like Turo. Which by the way, I'm not saying good or bad. I'm just saying anytime you have someone that's going to drive your vehicle, you don't have a lot of control over who it is. You wanna have more protection than, than less because you wanna always plan for the worst, unfortunately, right? And obviously you can make a case, well, if somebody's renting your car, what are they gonna do with it? Are they going to be involved in a crime? I mean, you just have no idea. So food for thought. We're gonna take another quick break and then we're going to continue on with more of your questions. I hope this is helpful for you. Again, the phone lines are open for your calls, 559-656-0317 or email at questions at insurancehour.com. Take a quick break and we will be back with more of your questions. This is Insurance Hour and I am Carl Sussman. Stand by. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the Magic Podcast Show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Gray. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the Window to the Magic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. Phone lines are open at 559-656-0317. You can email your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. To text a question or get help right away, you can shoot a text over to 567-ASK-CARL. That's 567-367-5275. It's Carl with a K, by the way, or you will not get to me. We are taking questions today from all of you out there. We've got emails, we have voicemails, we have messages that were texted in, you name it, they're here. And we are going through them one by one. Let's see, our next question is, what happens if my rental car is involved in an accident? Hmm, this is a great question. Now, rental cars are interesting because you're driving them, you're driving them with permission, but you're also in a situation where a third party has ownership of the vehicle. This also gets back into the question of, well, should I take the insurance from the rental car company? Let's start with that one and work backwards. People ask me, should we take the insurance when renting a car? And I will typically say, it's, it's up to you, but I like to do it and I'll tell you why. When you take the insurance from the rental car company, you are putting one more buffer between you and a claimant or damage to the vehicle that you're renting. I get it, it's more money, but what happens is if you're involved in an accident or if you return the car, and I have heard of this happening, people will return the car and they'll say, oh, they're claiming there's damage, that damage was there before. And unfortunately, it's a he said, she said. Not all rental car companies are very good about looking and taking pictures and inspecting the vehicle when you take it out. 
So, or they'll see something and they don't mark it down and you return it and the next person looks at it and says, hey, that wasn't there, you must have done it. If you don't have the insurance, then they are going to charge you for that. You are going to be responsible. Now, there's two types of insurance that you can get from the rental car companies, two broad kinds of insurance. One is liability insurance, right? That's what's going to protect you from third parties and involved in an accident with you. And one is simply physical damage on the car you're renting. Bare bones, I would say it's probably a good idea to get that physical damage coverage from the company. Now, having said that, we'll move on. Most insurance policies, most personal automobile insurance policies will extend to a rental car while you're using it temporarily. Most of them. You also want to be sure that you're checking with your insurance carrier to find out, in fact, if I rent a car, does my insurance go on? Does my insurance policy, do the coverages that I have on my personal auto policy extend to a rental car? And again, another little tree. It's not a rental car that you're using because your car is in the shop after a claim. It's simply a rental car that you're renting for pleasure, right? All these little nuances are important to understand because they do impact whether coverage would apply or not. So back to the old adage, go ahead, be sure to ask, don't assume, and find out. And even if your carrier says, yes, your coverage will, will follow you onto a new policy, or I'm sorry, onto a new, uh, onto a temporary rental car while you're on vacation, keep in mind, if you are involved in an accident, it will be on your auto insurance policy. And what that means is you could potentially be surcharged for it. Now, why is that different than driving your car every day? Typically, if you're renting a car, you might be in an area you're not as familiar with. And the likelihood of being involved in an accident or having some type of a claim tends to be higher statistically. It's kind of sad, but it's true. But we're more familiar with the roads we live on and uh, roads that are near our home, and we know them. When we're out of town, if we're on vacation, maybe we've had a drink, bad, 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 very bad, and because we're on vacation. So maybe we're not 100% sharp behind the wheel as we should be. Unfortunately, claims do happen with more frequency sometimes when people are renting a car when they're on vacation. And I, I get that, that several hops that I'm going through. First, you're on vacation and you're drinking and or you're just not paying attention and or it's a road you're not familiar with. I get it. There's a lot of air, a lot of gray here. But all I'm saying is keep in mind that the potential is there. Always find out if your particular policy is going to extend coverage. Some will, some won't. And at the end of the day, if you can afford it, if it's something you're not going to be completely frustrated with, yeah, take the insurance from the rental car company and, and, and call it a day, right? Sometimes it's better safe than sorry. All right, next question is, what do insurance companies drop policyholders after a claim? Uh, I think they meant why. Uh, first little terminology. Uh, I, I don't like it when people say, I got dropped. My insurance company dropped me. They've non-renewed you or they've canceled the policy if that happens midterm, which is much less common, but they've non-renewed you. Drop just sounds so arbitrary. And believe me, an insurance carrier cannot arbitrarily non-renew your policy. There has to be a reason. There's state guidelines in every state that mandate the insurance carrier have a reason they're going to non-renew you. Might not always be a great reason, but there has to be a reason. There is no arbitrary nature to being non-renewed. So for me, when I hear I got dropped by my insurance carrier, first I just ruffle a little bit because again, I don't like the term drop, I, you are non-renewed and there is a reason. So let's find out why. The question is, I think, meant why do insurance companies drop you after a claim? Typically, that's not what's going to happen. But this goes back to what I said in an earlier segment, which is you might have never had a claim, right? For 10 years, 20 years, and that's great. You're going to be paying a rate based on that. You're going to have a policy based on someone that has never had a claim. Now you've had a claim, and depending on what that claim is, you're a different exposure now. You're no longer someone that for 20 years has never had a claim. You are now someone who just had a claim. So it's possible, depending on what the nature of the claim is, that the insurance carrier, again, based on state regulations and guidelines, they can't just do something willy-nilly, might decide that you no longer qualify for the particular program that they had you with currently right? The type of policy that you have that is going to be giving you a rate and coverage for, let's just say, 20 years without a claim might not be priced, might not be the same product that you would need to be in once you've had a claim. Not a bad thing or a good thing, just 
different. And again, this varies a lot by states. Some states, insurance carriers have multiple tiers for people, depending on if they've had claims, if they haven't, what types of claims, how much was paid out, how frequently have they been having claims. And when I say tears, I mean levels, not tears, even though it feels like we should be crying sometimes when our rates go up if we have had a claim. Rest assured that none of this happens in a vacuum. Your state's Department of Insurance is watching this stuff very closely to be sure that everything is done legally based on the regulations and non-discriminatory. You can't be discriminated against. That's a very, very big deal. If you think you are being discriminated against in your insurance policy or with your carrier, definitely check in with your state's Department of Insurance because that is a big no-no. No, no, no. Got it? All right, we're gonna take another quick break and then we will be back to talk more about the questions that you've sent in. Remember, you can send your questions in as well. Just give us a call at 559-656-0317 or send them in by email at questions at insurancehour.com. Or of course, you can text them over to 5674-CARL. That's 567 F-O-R-K-A-R-L, or for those of you that like it, 367-5275. Taking a quick break, we will be back with your questions. This is Insurance Hour, and I am Carl Sussman, your host. Be right back. Do you need homeowner's insurance? Has your previous insurance company left the state, non-renewed your policy, or maybe they just raised your premium to an amount that you simply can't afford? Whatever the situation, we can help. Just dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say keyword insurance quote, and we will connect you with an agent who can assist you right away. Or if you prefer, you can visit us online at insurancehour.com forward slash quotes. Whether you're looking for homeowner's insurance or auto insurance, we'll send the best options straight to you. So what are you waiting for? Simply dial pound 250 and say keyword insurance quote. And we will connect you with a live agent to help provide competitive quotes for your homeowner's insurance or auto insurance. Don't get caught unprepared. Insure what matters with an insurance company you can trust and with a premium that you can afford. Don't put off until tomorrow what you should have done yesterday. Simply dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say keyword insurance quote. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. Phone lines are open, 559-656-0317. You can also send your questions in by email to questions at insurancehour.com or give us a text at 5674-CARL. That's 567-F-O-R-K-A-R-L or 567-367-5275. No excuse not to find us now. Listen, this has been a full show. We've had lots of information. If you've missed any of it, be sure to jump back and get the beginning. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, pretty much everywhere, even Amazon Alexa. Uh, Just search for Insurance Hour and you will find us and find this show. Lots of important information, lots of your questions being answered. And on that note, we'll jump right back in. How can an insurance policy that covers multiple vehicles... Hmm. I think they're asking how can a policy or do do policies cover multiple vehicles? If that's the question that's being asked, the answer is yes. Many insurance policies can cover multiple vehicles, multiple people that are driving, right? A personal auto policy can cover you and another vehicle and another person. Commercial auto policies, again, multiple vehicles, multiple policies. Keep in mind there's something called insurable interest. That means that you need to have an insurable interest in the item that's being insured. This is not just auto insurance, by the way. So for example, I cannot insure your car. I don't have an interest in it. I will not be affected, is the way the law says. Not an attorney, gotta always say that if I say anything about the law. Uh, it, basically, if I can't have a loss, suffer a loss because of your car, then I have no insurable interest, therefore I cannot insure it. So if you're looking to get an auto insurance policy, you can't put yourself and your friend on it, maybe your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your significant other. You can't just randomly put somebody on there because people that are on the same policy have to have insurable interests in the items that are being insured. Okay, I think that was the question and the answer is yes with that caveat. Next question is, how can I find an insurance policy that covers multiple vehicles? Oh, I think they sent that in twice because that was asking, how do they? So let's just move on to the next one. 
How did my rate increase after a single claim with no prior accidents? Right, we talked about this earlier today. Uh, I'm gonna go through it quickly again, but you can also skip back and listen to it. Understand that insurance carriers are regulated, right? They cannot look at you however they like. They have to file guidelines with the state's Department of Insurance that dictate what they can look at, what they can't, what they can charge premium based on, what they can't, how long can they look at your driving record or whatever claim record, and how long can they not. There are, it's, high, it's a highly, highly regulated industry. Now, if you're a driver, and let's just say for 20 years you've been driving, no problem, no tickets, no accidents, then you're going to get the rate for someone that's driving and not having tickets or accidents. Super, good on you. If all of a sudden you have a single claim, which is what this claim says, a single claim, why does the rate change? Here's the problem or the solution or the situation, depending on how you wanna look at it, from what perspective. You are no longer a person with 20 years without a ticket or accident. You have now had an accident. That's what's most recent. That's the you that's the most current, right? What makes the most sense to you if you were trying to roll the dice and decide if someone's going to have a ticket or accident? Would you say you want the person that in the last 12 months has had no accident? Or do you want the person that in the last 12 months has had one accident? Now I get it. You wanna say, yeah, but what about the last 19 years? I get it. But the way all insurance policies work is they have a policy period. They go for a particular period of time and then they renew. When the policy renews, that gives you and the insurance company, that's their and your time to say, do we wanna keep this? Do we wanna stay together? Do we wanna break up? You will look at your policy and decide based on what it looks like, what the price is, what your needs are, if you wanna keep the policy. And the insurance carrier will look at you and go through the process and decide whether they want to keep you at that price or at all or make changes. And what they're going to do is they're going to look at the past 12 months and they're going to say, well, this person has an accident. So you're going to see a different price for someone that has an accident in the last 12 months versus someone who doesn't. And I understand that, but what about the 19 years? And yes, for those 19 years, that was great and you were likely paying a rate for somebody that wasn't having tickets or accidents for 19 years, but now you're not that person. What makes the most sense? Looking at someone's, what were they like 20 years ago or what were they like now? I'd love to look at myself the way I was 20 years ago in a lot of ways. I'm not, I am who I am today. The way I am today is the most accurate reflection of who I am. And insurance carriers do the same thing. They're going to look at what the most recent activity is not necessarily what your overall forever historical activity was. Are you with me? A little frustrating, but that is the way the process works. Those are all of the auto insurance questions that were uh, sent in in the last week or two. Uh, I'm gonna switch to homeowner's insurance now. If you missed any of the auto insurance quotes or questions that is, go back, back to show up and get to the beginning because we went over probably a dozen of them and there's some good information in there. Let's move on to the homeowner's insurance related questions. The first one says, why is it so hard to get homeowner's insurance in a high risk area? This is a great question. First, let's try and generally describe what is a high risk area. A high risk area might be an area that your home is located in that is higher than average in the potential for it to have a loss. It might be a home that is right on the sand and maybe there's the potential exposure for the ocean to come in and cause water damage. Maybe it's in the middle of a canyon and the potential for there being fire damage is higher. Maybe it's up in the hills. It's 40 miles from a fire station. It's up a tiny road that it you know, takes you half an hour just to navigate to get there. These are things that can make your home potentially a higher risk than the house that is in the middle of the city with a fire station down the street, fire hoses and fire extinguishers and fire hydrants and everything at close proximity. So why is it harder? I'll, I'll change their question. They said, why is it so hard? I'll say, why is it harder to get insurance in those areas and the answer is because it is a higher risk. Not all insurance companies are comfortable or designed with their products to be able to insure homes that are in higher than average areas. So you're going to find a smaller niche of companies that are designed and priced and can underwrite homes that are in areas that are more difficult to insure. So yes, it's going to be harder and the chances are you will probably pay more premium than someone that's not in one of those higher risk areas 
But I do appreciate the fact that you're able to recognize that it's harder to get insurance in a high risk area and not just why is it so hard to get insurance? Because it is, it's always going to be harder to get insurance in a higher risk area, which makes sense. That's like saying, why do I have to pay more money for a more expensive car? Well, the two go hand in hand. With that, let's take another quick break. We will come back with questions and we will keep going with the homeowner's insurance questions. This is Insurance Hour and I am your host, Carl Sussman. Be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the Magic Podcast Show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Gray. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the Window to the Magic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. Phone lines are open for your questions about insurance. Give us a call at 559-656-0317 or shoot us a question by email at questions at insurancehour.com. You can also send us a text at 5674-CARL. That's 567-367-5275. Today, we are going through questions that you have submitted and I am going to answer them to the best of my ability, but I wanna make a point before I continue. I'm not perfect. I do the best I can. I've been licensed and in this business for 30 years and I do the best that I can. If you hear something that just seems absolutely impossible or inaccurate, let me know because my goal is to always get the right information to you, but I'm not perfect. So if you find that you've heard something that might be wrong, let me know, let me check it. Let me be sure that I'm giving the right information because I will go and make good on anything I've said that might be wrong. Again, the goal is to get accurate information to you and I do the best I can, but I can certainly use the help of the masses. So if you're hearing something that seems wrong to you, let me know. I'll learn something new potentially, so will you and I will share it with everybody. And if it turns out that you're wrong and I was right, you'll learn something then as well. All right, on that note, let's move forward. What do I do if my homeowner's insurance claim is denied? All right, this is a pretty broad question, but in general, and I think I can extrapolate this to basically any claim that's being denied, not just a homeowner's insurance claim. If you have a claim that's denied, the first thing you wanna do is take a breath because that does not by any stretch of the imagination immediately mean that you are not going to get anything paid. Yes, I said that. Yes, I went there. Sometimes a claim can be denied because you have not provided enough information, sufficient information, the right information, timely information. It might be something that you can basically correct. Now, I do see this happen on occasion where people will have a claim, they'll be asked for information, for whatever reason, and I get it, life life happens, people don't get that information into the adjusters right away. We actually had a claims adjuster on not long ago, and we talked a little bit about this. If you missed that, check out the history of some of our shows. Look for the interview that we did with Rachel Goldman. She was a claims adjuster. I called the claims adjuster extraordinaire. Uh, it was a good interview. Anyway, my point is that sometimes a claim can be denied for something that you can correct. And that's simply because you haven't yet gotten sufficient information to the claims adjuster. Now. Claims adjusters, just like insurance companies, have are heavily regulated, meaning they have to do things in a timely manner. They cannot keep your claim open indefinitely, right? So if they're asking you, for example, they're asking for receipts, or they're asking you for you to get an estimate on damages, and you don't get it after a period of time, they're going to deny the claim. They have to, because the, they're not permitted to just keep the claim open indefinitely, all right? So first thing, 
if your claim is denied, find out, is it something that you can correct? Is there something you've done wrong or you've not given enough information on to be able to get the claim handled? So if you've done all of that and there's simply policy language that is not permitting you to collect on your claim, what I would first do is read it. I know it's not fun. Nobody likes to read insurance policies. Okay, guilty, I am, I do, but most people don't. But the insurance adjuster likely will give you just the blurb from the policy that explains why your claim is being denied. Take a few minutes and read it. Really read it and see, in fact, does that language apply to you? Because claims adjusters, again, are just people too. They're looking at reading the same policy language that you now have in front of you. So take the time and read it. Maybe you have a friend or a family member that's an attorney, have them take a peek at it too and say, this is what the language says, this is my claim. Is, is, am I missing something here or is it legitimately just not something covered under my policy? A lot of times, yeah, I guess I can say a lot of times, a lot of times you're able to go back to the claims adjuster and say, I've read the policy and it's saying X, Y, and Z and you can actually quote it. However, my situation is not X, Y, and Z, it's ABC. They've simply made a mistake. It does happen. And you can have your claim reopened and you could potentially have coverage from there. Now, if it turns out that you've looked at the policy language and you don't agree, but the adjuster looks at it and they simply disagree, you can ask the adjuster to please escalate this to another claims adjuster or claims supervisor. You can do all of this on your own. You can just ask, you have that right. That one claims adjuster is not the only barrier to you getting paid that exists. That's just the gatekeeper. That's just the first person that you can potentially speak with. Ask for a supervisor, ask for a manager, ask and find out. Because the most important thing and the, one of the frustrations that I hear from people all the time is their claim was denied so they went and they got an attorney and we'll get there. That's definitely something that has to happen sometimes. But a lot of times, they miss the steps before that. They miss the steps of when they can reach back out to the adjuster and have a conversation to try and find out was something misinterpreted. They miss the step when they ask for a supervisor and have another pair of eyes look at the claim. They miss the point when they could potentially have a friend or a family member just glance at this text in the policy and read it and see. Maybe you're too emotionally invested in it and to you it seems ridiculous, but yeah, that's actually what the text says. Sometimes just having another pair of eyes look at it, other than the claims adjuster, someone you know, they might look at you and say, yeah, sorry, yeah, that's how I read it too. If after all of this, you still feel strongly that your claim is being un incorrectly denied, then you do have the ability to go to an attorney for assistance. What that will do is immediately change the adjuster because most adjusters are going to have claims that are what are called unrepresented, meaning claim clients that don't have an attorney. And some claims adjusters will work specifically with people that do have an attorney representing them. So you may need to go that path. There is no shortage of good attorneys out there that can assist you with that process and go about and do that. I actually did an interview with an attorney uh, named Dennis Beaver and he was talking about how to find a good attorney. And uh, you can go back in the shows and you'll find it. great guy. And he suggests that the best way to find a good attorney is to look locally. Ask your friends, ask family members, not just to randomly pick someone on a billboard. He said, if I can remember correctly from the interview, that you want the people that are in your neighborhood. Not bad advice. You can go back and find that show again. It's under Dennis Beaver, or you can simply do a quick search for Dennis Beaver, Carl Sussman, some combination of that, and you'll probably find we've talked two or three times. He's a great guy. Great advice too, let me tell you. We have one more break and then we're gonna go through the rest of these questions. Well, not all of them clearly, but as many as we can. Remember, I want your questions. Send them in anytime at 559-656-0317. If we don't answer, just leave a voicemail and say, hey, here's my question. Let me know the answer and I will get it the next time we have one of these shows. Also send your emails in to questions at insurancehour.com. Love getting those. And that's what I'm reading on right now, directly from your emails. One more break and we will be back. 
Are you feeling lost in the search for the right insurance? Making call after call, only to find no one willing to go that extra mile for you? At Sussman Insurance Agency, we understand that frustration, and we're here to change your experience. Where others see obstacles, we see opportunities. While many might shy away from jumping through hoops, at Sussman Insurance Agency, we are prepared to leap. Looking under every rock, exploring every avenue, that's not just what we do, it's who we are. Our dedicated team doesn't just offer policies, we provide solutions. Solutions born from persistence, expertise, and a genuine commitment to finding you the best coverage possible. We don't just meet expectations, we surpass them. If you're tired of hearing no or it's not possible, it's time to turn to a team that believes in yes and let's make it happen. Don't settle for less. Reach out to Sussman Insurance Agency at 877-411-5200. Visit us online at sussmaninsurance.com or email sales at sussmaninsurance.com. Let's uncover the insurance solutions you deserve. Sussman Insurance Agency, going the extra mile every time. Hello, hello, this is Insurance Hour and I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. Phone lines are still open, 559-656-0317. Send your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. You can also send a text to 567-4CARL, that's 567-F-O-R-K-A-R-L, or 567-367-5275. Whew, a lot of ways to say the same thing. We are going through your questions today and we are in the final segment. We've had a lot of information here. If you've missed any, go back, find the show, just search for Insurance Hour. You'll find us as a podcast everywhere, also on YouTube, pretty much all over the place. And find this show and be sure you listen to all of it because there's a lot of information that will probably be helpful for you. Let's go on to the next few questions that we can get in here. Let's see, uh, this is an interesting one. Can my insurance increase because of my neighbor's claim? Dun, dun, dun. What's the old expression that I've heard about neighbors? The only neighbor is not to have one. A good neighbor is to not have one or something along those lines. And claims with neighbors are difficult, they really are. In a nutshell, typically if your neighbor has a claim, that's not going to impact you. Somehow, though, I have a sneaky suspicion that that's not really what was being asked in this question. And I think the, the question that's really being asked is, if I have to file a claim because of my neighbor, am I going to have an issue with that? And the answer is, it just depends. All claims are looked at on their own merit, right? So it really just depends on what it is that you're going to be putting a claim in for. I would say one of the more common claims that you'll have with neighbors are what are called um, boundary limit claims, right? Someone decides that, oh, you're actually on my property all, all this time. And there's precedent there and there's legal issues and things that are far beyond the scope of my knowledge to be able to discuss. But as a general rule, if you're putting in a claim on your policy, you could potentially have to deal with that. If you're putting in, if your neighbor is putting in a claim on their policy, well, then that would more than likely not impact you. Hopefully that answers your question. Next question says, how do I get insurance for an older home with outdated wiring? Wow, that's unbelievably specific. So an older home with outdated wiring, the first thing is update the wiring, okay? The reason you're asking the question is likely because you've tried to obtain insurance and been denied. Wiring cause, you know, old wiring, old you know, fuses and knobs and tubes and all that stuff, they, they cause fires, they just do. There's a reason that you don't find them in newer homes, it's because they're not as safe. So I know it's easy to say, just replace it as if it's just you snap your fingers and it happens. But the first thing I would tell you is, you're going to be going with an insurance company that is going to be charging you more money because you don't have the updated electrical, you just will. At some point, if you add up how much more you're going to be spending in insurance because you have the outdated wiring, you might all of a sudden realize that, wow, I could have gotten the wiring updated, and not had to continue paying more indefinitely. Not to mention the fact that it simply is more dangerous. Now that I'm done lecturing you, the way you get coverage if you have a home that has outdated wiring is you have to go to some of the smaller insurance companies and they will offer you at a premium, at a higher premium coverage potentially, but they are going to charge more than the carriers that will you know, only insure you with updated wiring. And again, there's a reason for that. So again, my best advice, if at all possible, get the wiring updated, it's safer and it will save you money in the long run. Next question, uh, what should I do if my insurance company refuses to communicate with my adjuster? I'm not quite sure how that would work. The adjuster works for the insurance company. 
So I'm not sure how an insurance company would refuse to talk to their own adjuster. Maybe you're talking about a situation where there's a claim with another insurance company and your insurance company adjuster doesn't want to talk to that insurance company's adjuster, something like that. I'm not really sure where to go with this. So in general, claims adjusters, again, we had a great interview with a claims adjuster. If you want to get some of their insight, do a quick search for uh, Rachel Goldman, Carl Sussman, Insurance Hour, something like that, and you'll find the interview. But one of the things you need to understand with the claims adjusters are they're, they're, they have a job to do. If your claims adjuster in their job needs to communicate with another claims adjuster from another insurance company, they will do that. If they're not, then the claims adjuster is simply not doing their job. If that happens, what do you do? Like I said in an earlier segment, ask for a supervisor. Don't get yourself all bent out of shape. Don't go running around screaming and yelling and not accomplishing anything. Take that break, take a breath and say, and don't be a jerk about it because it's just going to make it harder and tell your adjuster, say, I'd like to speak with someone that you know you report to, or is, do you have a supervisor that I can speak with? Or is there another adjuster that might be able to help me? I, I feel like I'm not really getting the attention that I need. I, need, I think there's things you need to be doing that you aren't. Uh, and, and again, you're, you're probably thinking, well, why do you have to kiss their you know what? So they're your claims adjuster. You've been paying premium for them. All true, 100% true, but they're still people. And sometimes, just like with everything else, there's good claims adjusters and there's bad claims adjusters. You might just have a bad one. Sometimes you might have an average one, but because you actually phrased it a little nicer than the average Joe, they might say, you know what, this guy's really nice. Let me, let me make this file a priority. Let me work on this one. Again, it's an imperfect system because we're dealing with people. We're imperfect, we're people. Let's move on to the next one. Can I switch homeowners and insurance policies midterm? Great question. And the answer is yes. The real answer is, the real question you're asking is, can you do it without a financial penalty? And that answer is depends. Most insurance carriers, if they are admitted in the state they're doing business, they will prorate you on cancellations as long as you've had at least one policy period with them, meaning you've renewed at least once. If you're with a non-admitted carrier, there's something that's typically called minimum earned premium. Some admitted carriers will have this as well, meaning regardless of when you decide to cancel, usually it's 25% to start they're going to keep that amount of money no matter what, okay? Now, if I was taking your question completely literally and you're asking, can I switch midterm? Sure, go right ahead. If money is no object, you can certainly do it. You can, requ we can request a refund from the current carrier. You might get it. You might get a prorated. You might get a short rated. Who knows? You're certainly not bound. It's not a contract that you have to keep. You can request it being canceled at any time. The impact simply is, are you going to get all of your money back or not? All right. So with that, I want to just get ready to close the show up. I don't want to start another question because I won't want to answer it. I want to thank you all for spending time here and learning with me. The goal is to learn. The goal is to educate. The goal is for us to all be better insurance consumers and have a better understanding of how the process works. Hopefully I'm helping you accomplish that. I do appreciate your calls, your questions, your emails, your texts, all that good stuff. Feel free to follow on any of the typical social media platforms. I do try and answer questions there as well. I do try and post some interesting information as well as things come out. But again, uh, my main focus is this program to spend my time here. So make sure that you subscribe, log in, listen in, whatever the case may be, however you're catching this show, keep doing it. I really appreciate it. Again, this is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman, thanking you humbly for spending your time with me today, and I will speak with you again soon. Take care and stay safe. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 Six five six zero three one seven. Educating and entertaining Californians, one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. This show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.